Can't happen in America? Stay tuned. I am your host, William Cooper.
Ah, uh, it's May 6th, 1992. This is my birthday, folks, and I'm going to do a show tonight that I don't want to do, but it's got to be done by somebody, and I'm the one that's going to do it. We've all been watching our television for the last week and a half, listening to the radio, watching fires burn, watching stores, businesses looted, watching a poor truck driver yanked out of his truck and beat senseless on the ground. When he got up and tried to get away, he got into his truck, he couldn't see. A woman came up and asked him, can you see? He said, no. She said, I'll be your eyes. And such was the scenes that we watched. And we were torn, torn between understanding and loathing and hatred and love and shame. And what for? And that's the subject of tonight's The Hour of the Time. What it's like to be a black person in America? It's like being in hell. If you can visualize that, it's like being in a living hell. Your life is not worth anything. And that's a sad commentary. Black in America, even in 19... 19- 92 hasn't changed much. We have no rights that the white man respect. Four police officers stood trial in Simi Valley, California, for the beating of a man named Rodney King, a black man. The jury came across with its final verdict on a day that will live in infamy. And for some people, the day will be famous, for they loved the verdict. Those people are racist. They're people with no heart. The verdict was, for three of the defendants, not guilty on all counts, complete acquittal. For the last defendant, Officer Powell, was not guilty on all counts but one, and the last count that he used excessive force was a hung jury. An incredible verdict in light of the fact that the entire nation and the world had been viewing an amateur videotape that had been taken on the scene which showed over 50 blows. I believe the correct number was 56 blows in 80 seconds to a man who was lying on the ground who had no weapon, who posed no threat, who did not attack anyone during this time. But nevertheless, 56 blows from clubs, what the officers called batons, that's a polite name for a club, a stick. And I believe no one believed that those officers would be found innocent. Hardly anyone, anyway. I'm sure that there were some people who felt that the officers were justified. There always is. I'm sure that most police officers sided with their peers. I'm sure that they felt the officers should be excused, overlooked, that they should be forgiven because of the dangers of the job, because that they go out in the street every day and they could be killed at any given moment so that it makes them do things that sometimes people should not do. Is that justified? Should people think that way? Well, that's been the debate all over the nation and all around the world. And in the main, I have to say, that argument has lost. Most people were shocked. Shocked to the very core of their being over that verdict. And not just blacks. Whites were shocked. Hispanics were shocked. Puerto Ricans were shocked. Chinese people were shocked. Japanese people were shocked. And of course, the black community was outraged in a country with a history of prejudice, oppression. In a country 
For to be a black person is a struggle from the moment of birth until the moment of death. This was an outrage. It was as if they had already been thrown into the cesspool of life. And somebody had come along and dumped another cesspool right on top of them. It took all the hope away from these people. At least that's what they tell me. And I have to tell you, it took some hope away from me because I've been predicting this for a long, long time. In fact, I'm going to give you now a speech that I delivered in New York City on April the 26th, 1992, just a few days before this incident took place. The incident that resulted in hundreds of buildings burned to the ground. I believe the last count that I heard, 1,700 buildings burned to the ground in Los Angeles. Over 40 people dead, more than in the Watts riots. Hundreds of people wounded. Over 700 people arrested. Many businessmen out of business forever. An entire economic community destroyed. I have to tell you, folks, no business, no businessman in his right mind will ever go back into South Central Los Angeles and open a grocery store, supermarket, a discount store, an electronic store, a stereo store, any kind of store not going to happen. It is not going to happen. And if those people thought that they were bad off before, they are now destitute. In New York City on April the 26th, this is what I told my audience of approximately 600 people. I asked them to close their eyes. And on their eyelids to draw a map of the United States and all of its possessions. And on that map, place a dot for every city and town in this great nation of ours. Every city and town. Put a dot there. Now, if you're like I am, you've got so many dots there, you probably couldn't count them in a week. Because that's how big this country is. I want you all to understand that at any given moment of any given hour of any given day of any given week of any given month of any given year if you've got enough money in every single one of those towns or cities you can buy as much of any type of drug that you can imagine or that you could possibly want if you have the money to pay for it on some street corner and in some cities and towns on many street corners. Now I want you to take yourself and your imagination to that street corner in whatever town that you pick. And I want you to understand that whatever amount of money you have in your hand will buy whatever amount of drugs, of any kind of drug that you want, any kind, at any time. And there will never be a shortage. The drugs will always be there as long as you have the money in your hand. Now just imagine, what kind of a supply system does that require? Do you understand how much cargo of drugs has to be coming into this country continually, all the time, to make sure that each drug in its exact quantity that's needed in each city, in each town of this country is delivered to that city 
in that state or in that town, in that state, on time, so that there's never a shortage? Do you realize that in Silmar, California, which is in the San Fernando Valley, near Los Angeles, in a warehouse with a cheap padlock on the door and no guard anywhere, law enforcement officials found 22 tons of pure cocaine. 22 tons of pure cocaine. They confiscated it, took it away. Now that has a street value of $22 billion. Not million, billion, spelled with a B. When I read that in the Los Angeles Times and saw it on television, I began to try to track that cocaine. I was told that it was placed in the property unit of the Los Angeles Police Department. When I attempted to verify that it was there, I was told that it was not. When I tried to trace it from the property department of the Los Angeles Police Department, according to proper procedures, it should have been burned, destroyed. However, there was no record of its destruction. There was no record of its ever having left the property department. There was no record of any trace of that 22 tons of pure cocaine. $22 billion street value. And I hope you understand that that's just one city, one little small town. In fact, Silmar is not very big. It is not Los Angeles. One little small town in this whole nation. Now, just in the last few days, I believe they found six tons of cocaine in a warehouse somewhere and, and uh, a whole bunch of tons of cocaine in another warehouse somewhere. But you see, I don't even pay any attention to it anymore because I know that if you try to trace those those bags of cocaine, you won't find them. They go right back out onto the street, right through the police department as if it's got holes in it. It's incredible. You see, because money talks. The old saying is, BS walks. You all know what that means. Money talks. Pretty hard for somebody to burn 22 tons of cocaine, but that's not the reason why it wasn't burned. So you have to understand, to get that much drugs into this country, so that every little city and town in this entire country is supplied with drugs, it takes much more, much, much more. So much more that it's almost impossible to imagine much more than any Colombian drug lord could ever handle. And there's no Colombian drug lord that has anywhere near the amount of money that would be required to perform a logistics operation of that magnitude. When I was with the Office of Naval Intelligence, my friends, I can tell you that I discovered that the drugs are being brought into this country by the military and the intelligence community. And the way they get through customs officials and by law enforcement officers is that they are classified cargoes, secret cargoes, top secret cargoes. No one could look at them unless they had the clearance and the need to know the cargo is addressed to them. Much of the drugs are flown in to places like Edwards Air Force Base, California. There's a place in uh, Arizona, which is a CIA proprietary airfield. There's a place in Florida, Homestead Air Force Base, and many, many others. There are tunnels going underneath the Mexican border. The Mexicans didn't dig those tunnels. No, these are smooth operations. No one ever gets caught in a drug war, except users. Have you ever noticed that? 
are small time operators with real small cargoes. And any time a huge, tremendous cargo is ever caught, like the 22 tons of Silmar, no one is ever arrested, and the drugs always conveniently disappear right back out on the street. Well, what's this all about, and what's it got to do with Rodney King? Well, I'll tell you, folks. In this country, most people who aren't black have not liked blacks. In fact, appear to be afraid of them. I don't know why. I really, honestly, truthfully don't know why. In my life, and in my book, I wrote about a good friendship between myself and a black man. In fact, he was the best man at my wedding. I've never had that problem, so I don't understand it. Maybe it's because I wasn't raised in the United States of America. My father was an Air Force officer, a command pilot, which means he'd flown thousands of hours in airplanes, and he's still alive to talk about it. He's a retired colonel, lives in the state of Texas. And wherever he went, we went. And because of that, I spent a good portion of my life in foreign countries. Living on military bases, Air Force bases. And nobody ever taught me to hate the black man, or the yellow man, or any other man for that matter. So because I never learned it, and it is a learned trait, because no child is ever born hating any other child because of the color of his skin. It doesn't happen. It's taught by parents, and by peers, and by neighbors, and by friends. It is a learned thing. It is a despicable thing. It is a tool that is used by the very powerful in this world to create dissension and hatred amongst the rest of us so that we struggle between classes and one class attempts to hold the class below it down while at the same time struggling up to the next higher class above itself while they try to hold that class down. And descendants of slaves in this country have always been the lowest rung on the ladder of classes. So what the Rodney King thing is all about, ladies and gentlemen, is dissension, is hatred. It's being used, and I'm telling you right now, it's created from the beginning. From the beginning, do you really believe that it was an accident that a judge changed the venue upon the request of the defense to the wealthiest county in the state of California, or one of the wealthiest, I, I might say, maybe not the wealthiest, but one of the wealthiest counties in the state of California, a county wherein over 2,000 police officers reside, a county where less than 2% of the population is black, a county who does not understand the violence, the oppression, the misery, the frustration of the people who live in South Central Los Angeles. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not sticking up for Rodney King. Rodney King committed a criminal act. He was drunk. He was speeding. He refused to stop when the police officers turned on their siren and tried to pull him over. Eventually, though, he was stopped. And when he was stopped, his two companions in the automobile got out of the automobile and surrendered to the officers and raised their hands behind their head and did exactly as they were told, and to my knowledge, they were not beaten. Rodney King, on the other hand, refused. He would not comply with the officer's orders. Therefore, when they tried to take him into custody, he resisted. He was then beaten, 
and for a few moments it was reasonable force. But when Rodney King was beaten to the ground and was unarmed and was rendered 56 blows with these clubs, these batons, in 80 seconds, that is excessive force. I don't care what he did. See, I fought in Vietnam. And I'm going to tell you right now, folks. When I shot somebody and he fell to the ground, I didn't shoot him again. Even if he was still alive. And I wouldn't have. Unless he went for a weapon. Or unless all of a sudden he became a very serious threat to me. Rodney King could not have been a threat to anyone. He was surrounded by officers. There were so many officers there that Rodney King could not have been a threat to anyone, could not have hurt anyone, could have been quickly overpowered without the use of any clubs whatsoever. But we're being propelled into a police state. You doubt it? Well, in the first night, the debut of this program, on May the 4th, I talked a little bit about that. I believe I talked a little bit of a, about it last night on May 5th. That program was taped April the 30th, I believe. But I want you to understand something. When you sit in front of your television on Friday and Saturday night and watch cops, top cops, lady cops, 911 cops, SWAT cops, detective cops, and all the other cops, grandma cops, and you sit there and watch them break down doors without identifying themselves, without a search warrant, without a court order, rip people's mattresses apart, tear their walls apart, throw all their clothes on the floor. And they do something that you don't see in that series. You know, they strip search people. You don't see that because they can't show it on television. But they do it. Now, if they don't find anything, folks, all they have to do is drop a little bag of white powder somewhere in that house. And now they own the house. They take it from you. You don't have it anymore. You'll never have it anymore. They can confiscate your bank account, your RV, your cabin, your property, land. Every single thing that you own, your cars, your clothes, and your children. And except for your children, they can auction it all off within 24 hours. And there's not a thing that you can say or do about it. They can do it without a court order, without a trial, and without even charging you with any crime. And it's happened to many people. And you sit there in front of your television sets and you cheer it on. Say, get them, get those scummy so-and-sos. I've watched it. I've seen it. I've been in living rooms where this has occurred. And the reason you do it is because you're watching it happen to blacks, minorities, poor white trash, what they call poor white trash down south. Puerto Ricans, Hispanics, and you say, get them, they're a threat to us, middle class. We've got to get the crime and drugs off the streets. That's your reasoning, and that's why you accept it. But most of you don't know anything about your country. You don't know what your country is. You don't understand that your country is the Constitution. And that when you allow these things to happen without protest, you are actually changing law. Because the common law, the basis of our legal foundation, says that if your rights are taken away and you do not protest or protect or claim your rights in a timely manner, then you no longer have those rights. They don't belong to you anymore. Hello. 
you see, the fourth article in Amendment to the Constitution, one of the original Bill of Rights, first ten amendments, says that all of those things cannot be done. It says that you can't search anybody's person, papers, or property unless upon the issuance of a warrant signed by a judge based upon testimony which produces probable cause that you have committed a crime. And the warrant must name the exact place to be searched and the exact items to be seized. So everything that they're doing is against the Constitution of the United States of America, which is this country. See, the United States of America is the Constitution and the Articles and Amendment thereof. Tear up that document, throw it away. This country ceases to exist. You have no more rights, no more protection, no more nothing. And that's what this is all about. They're setting us up to take away everything from us. And all of you people who are falling into it are setting the stage to have it done. If you're black and you participated in the looting and the burning and the rioting, you played right into the hands of those who would oppress us. You have been very stupid. If you're white and you participated in the looting and the fires and all of the other stuff, the rioting, you too were stupid. You played right into the hands of those who would oppress us. See, on television, I saw Hispanics, whites, blacks. Uh, I saw a mixture of every single ethnic group and race that exists in this country on the streets rioting. And if you were perceptive, you did too. I never saw a crowd of just blacks or a crowd of just Hispanics or a crowd of just whites. No, they were all mixed together. Having a great time. Taking advantage of the whole thing. And if I had my druthers, you'd all be in jail. Not just for looting and rioting. That didn't solve a darn thing. But for endangering the constitution of this great nation. See, I sympathize with you. I didn't like that verdict either. And you had a right to go out in the street and protest. You had a right to express your anger. And you should have. This whole nation would have been behind you if that's what you had have done. But you know what you really did? You scared the hell out of middle class America. Scared them bad. They'll never forget the scenes that they saw on that television set. They will never forget it. And you're going to hear things like this. Frighten so many people is uh, the number of guns. Uh, you have the, the number of guns in Los Angeles at the moment in the hands of private citizens. Yes. Uh, well, if you put guns out there thinking that uh, somehow they will be held only by law-abiding citizens, you're wrong. The thugs, the thieves, the hoodlums are going to get them, whether they have to steal them or whether they have to buy them. And you've got a lot of them in this city. And they're in the hands of young, irresponsible, uh, irrational young people. Do you get the drift? You see, this is going to be used as the excuse to take the second article in amendment in the Constitution away from the American people. It's going to be used further to strengthen the loss, strengthen the government's position on eliminating the Fourth Amendment. It's also going to be used to take away the writ of habeas corpus and probably a lot of other things, probably to eliminate the exclusionary rule so that they can find these guns and make sure that this kind of violence doesn't ever happen again. The image of that truck driver on the pavement, being kicked and beaten and hit almost to the point of death, just because he was there, will never leave the minds of middle-class America. Never. 
And no matter what they felt when they first viewed the Rodney King beating on the videotape, no matter what they felt then, this, I guarantee you, is what they feel now. I guarantee you that they are in full accord with this member of the jury who said this. Away. There were three people in the car that Rodney King was driving. All three of them were black. Two of them put their hands up and were handcuffed and booked in a proper procedure, and one chose not to be booked. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, Rodney King set the action. And there you have it. You see what it's all about. You've all been suckered. A Masonic judge, a Freemason, changed the venue to one of the wealthiest counties in the state of California, wherein 2,000 police officers lived and only had a population of less than 2% blacks. That in itself would have almost guaranteed an acquittal. But another Masonic judge, the one who actually tried the case, really did guarantee an acquittal. For the defense's entire case was that the officers acted in accordance with their training. Where have we heard that before? Wasn't the defense of the Nazis who were tried at Nuremberg that they were only following orders, obeying their superiors, carrying out the parameters of their training? This is an absolutely impossible, impossible concept for the American people to grasp and to hold on to. And you better understand what it means. We're being prepared for a police state. That's what cops, top cops, grandmother cops, SWAT cops, all the cop shows are all about. The glorification of the cops. What if they trained them to shoot you if you looked at them funny? You see, because the judge instructed the jury that if they found that the officers were acting within the parameters of their training, of their orders, that they could not be found guilty. And therein lies the rub. You see, it was all rigged from the beginning. The judges knew it. Everybody knew it. Did you know that Tom Bradley made a statement that in case the jury came in with a not guilty verdict that he expected, rioting, that he was not prepared? Why? you know that Daryl Gates made a statement that he had set aside monies to pay extra police officers and take care of all the extra forces and things that they would need because if the verdict came in not guilty, they expected rioting. Yet they had no extra forces. They were completely unprepared and nothing was done. Why? Because somebody wanted to scare the living daylights out of the middle class in this country so that they could justify taking away rights from the American people. And I got to tell you something. You all fell for it. All of you. You fell for it hook, line, and sinker, and you're going to suffer because of it. This was no accident. And I've talked to a lot of blacks in those neighborhoods by telephone good, honest people who did not participate in, in those things. But they were witnesses and they watched. And they tell me that some of the fires were started by their people. They saw them do it. But some of the fires were started by people they never saw before and were professionals. And professional. Professional techniques, professional fire bombs. And if you know anything about fires, you know 
that whole buildings don't go up at once unless somebody knows what they're doing. Somebody was following the looters around, and after they finished looting a building, they would go in and set a fire. They would instantly consume the building. Total conflagration. And then they would disappear. People who were not from the neighborhoods. Not from the neighborhoods. Somebody was running through the neighborhoods telling people that the merchandise in the stores were free. Now, that doesn't excuse them running down and taking merchandise out of the stores. It was despicable. The looting was despicable. I abhor it. And all who participated in it should be apprehended, should be tried, should be convicted, and should be thrown in jail. Anyone who hurt another person or destroyed anyone's property should be tried, convicted, and thrown in jail. As far as I'm concerned, anyone who killed another person should be tried, convicted, and I would hope that they would receive a death sentence. But that's not up for me to decide. See, I believe everyone has a right to be angry and has a right to protest, has a right to demonstrate, has a right to march in this country. But no one has a right to do what these people did. I believe that our police officers serve the public, should be polite, should be professional, and no one, no matter how guilty of any crime, should be subjected to a beating that we saw on that videotape being given to Rodney King. It's not up to the officers to judge punishment or to punish. Their job is to help the public, keep the public and their property safe, identify and apprehend criminals. And their job is to do it within the law and do it humanely. Training does not justify abuse. Hitler trained his SS to murder, cold-blooded murder people. And if their excuse didn't stand up in the Nuremberg trials, why should this excuse stand up with these four officers in any trial in this country? Because that is the whole key to the whole not guilty verdict. Was the defense's position that they were acting within the parameters of their training and the instructions of the judge to the jury that if they found that they were acting within the parameters of their training, they could not be found guilty. Which means, if during their training they were taught to rob a bank every third Sunday and to take that money and buy guns and to go out and kill two people every fourth Sunday, then they could not have been found guilty if all of that was taught to them during their training. This type of thinking in this country is insanity and cannot be allowed. And these Freemason, Masonic judges, who are part of the secret societies, who have infiltrated our society at all levels, and our government at all levels, and whose aim is to destroy the sovereignty of this nation and the sovereignty of all other nations, and bring into being a one-world totalitarian socialist government, must go. These people must be weeded out. They must be prosecuted and dealt with legally within the law. But it must be done. And if you don't think this is a conspiracy, you watch. See, I said that this would happen in New York City. I told those people in New York City that this would happen. And it has. I said in New York City to that audience that when the blacks found out how they were being used and how they were being intentionally addicted to a welfare state to create a dependent class of people 
and then the welfare benefits are withdrawn to create a criminal class of people. And then the criminal class of people is addicted to dope narcotics, not only as a feel-good substance and addiction, but as a method to fuel their economy, as a method to put food on the table. You have to understand, folks, that this accomplishes three things. Drug addiction for blacks or for anyone else is a form of euphemistic slavery. They are no danger to the ruling class, to the elite, or to anyone else. They are, in fact, slaves to their addiction. And they can be controlled by making the substance of their addiction, or the focus of their addiction, available or not available. Cheap or expensive. And they can be manipulated hither and thither, to and fro. They can be made to create crime, or they can be made docile as little lambs. It also creates huge, tremendous profits beyond your wildest imagination for the secret government. And they use these profits to finance and bring into being the New World Order, the One World Government, the police state that's to come. And number three, it scares the living daylights out of the middle class, out of the people who feel that they're a little better than everybody else because they have a little more than everybody else and they don't want to lose it. So they scream for protection. In the latest poll, folks, they were asked, would you be willing to give up some of your constitutional rights in order to get the drugs and crime off the streets? And guess what the answer was? The answer was yes, yes, yes. Yes, please take the drugs and crime off the streets. We will give up whatever we have to give up. But don't subject us to this fear. Well, if you think that they had fear before, they're trembling in their boots now. Trembling in their boots. And the cause of the black man in America has been tumbled backwards for a hundred years. At least. At least. And the black man will be lucky if he ever regains what he has lost over what has happened in the city of Los Angeles. And this is exactly what was supposed to happen. And all you kids, all you members of gangs out there, you want to feel like somebody? You want to be somebody? You get in touch with me and I'll show you how to be somebody. And I'll show you how to save yourselves and help save this country. Because this country is all you've got. You see, it's not middle class America that's oppressing you. We're all being used. All of us. We are all being manipulated and used like puppets. And with those with the power pull the strings, we dance and we like it. Because we've been taught that that's what we're supposed to do and that's what we're supposed to like. And that's what Los Angeles was all about. And that's what Rodney King was all about. Rodney King made an eloquent speech saying that he wasn't like that. And he wished the violence would stop. Well, Rodney King, i got a message for you, buddy. You should have thought of that before you got in that car and tried to outrace the police and then resisted arrest while you were drunk. I feel sorry for the beating you took, but don't tell me you're not like that. Because that's a crock. If you weren't like that, none of us would be in this situation we're in right now. Let's hope that you learn from this and that you won't be like that in the future. But don't tell me that you're not like that.
And what about all the black civil rights leaders who fueled this, and the congressmen who fueled this, and the media who fueled it? What about Congresswoman Waters from South Central L.A., who would ask if she would make a plea to stop the violence, said no, she wouldn't. What about all these self-serving, self-righteous leeches on the community that fueled this? It's time to wake up. It's time to take your power back. It's time to understand that I'm not your enemy, that you're not mine. It's time to understand that we're Americans, and we all live here together. Racism is evil. Anti-Semitism is evil. People cannot help what family they're born in. Whoever you are listening here right now, you had no choice into what your race is or who your parents were. No choice whatsoever. To hate a man or a woman because of the color of their skin or for anything else that is as stupid as that is insane. And if we continue to do that, we will surely deserve the harvest that we will reap from our actions. Racism is not born in anyone. It's taught. It's taught by parents, by teachers, by peers, by coaches, by friends, by relatives, by bus drivers. Some young men learn it when they go in the military service. Although the military service, I must say, is probably one of the best integrated least racial groups in this country. Now, some of you might want to know, how do I know all of these things? By what authority do I impart these words of wisdom to my listening audience? It's very simple, ladies and gentlemen. I used to be part of this group was bringing all these things about. I was there. I was in the midst of it. I was a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence. I saw plans for this over 20 years ago. For everything that's happening in the world today, I'm the only person in the world who has an absolute 100% accuracy rating on predicting future events. And so far, I've never been wrong. But I'm not bragging, and I'm not proud of that. You see, because I base all of this upon documents, plans, that I saw when I was a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence, and upon 20 years of research. I hope and pray every night that the next day I will be wrong. I want to be wrong because the day that I start to be wrong it means that we will start to win the war. So don't fool yourself. We are engaged in a war for our freedoms, for our future, for our existence. And we are in great danger from many, many, many things in many, many areas and one special group of people in particular. But the biggest enemy that we have on this earth is ourselves, our own ignorance, our apathy, our inability to see and to hear and to understand. Our willingness to elect somebody we never saw, don't know, and trust them explicitly and believe that they're a saint while they go trooping off to Washington. 
Have you ever stopped to think how absolutely absurd that is? Absurd. Most of you can't trust your own relatives. Can you trust some stranger to go off and represent you in Washington, and then you forget about it and trust that person to do the right thing? And then you wonder what happens when they don't? Come on. Wake up. I mean it. And you better wake up and start voting. And you better throw all the bums out, put some citizens in there, and you better restrict the terms to one term. Because if they decide to become a professional career politician, that means they got to get reelected. If they got to get reelected, they can't do the right thing. That's what's wrong with this country. They can't do the right thing. So they're easily corrupted. Easily bought and paid for. Easily steered down the path away from us. And at some point along the line, their conscience doesn't even bother them anymore. They don't even care about us. Why? Because here's what they think of us. And on a daily basis, we prove them right. Quote, A nation, a world of people, who do not use their intelligence, are no better than animals who do not have intelligence, and thus are stakes on the table by choice and consent. Unquote. You fit into that category? Do you? Think about it honestly. Look yourself in the mirror. If you do, admit that you've been stupid and decide that you're never going to be stupid again for the rest of your life. It's important. Help me. Good night. And God bless you all. Light out on the hour. It is the hour of the time. Light out for the curfew of your body, soul, and mind.